Okay, well, this is my friend Jason Stanley. And Jason Stanley is not only a philosopher, but he's also a public philosopher. And when I say public philosopher, I don't simply mean by somebody who just goes before the public, but I mean it in the classic uh, Weberian sense, as a person who understands that there's a responsibility philosophy has. He, 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 he sometimes resorts to lowly things like teaching at universities, as <laughs> I'm known to do. Uh, but actually, to be, to be frank, I take the position that the academic world, that academe, that academic knowledge is actually vital. I actually am not one of these public intellectual snobs. And one of the things I'm grateful for Jason for is not only his, his work he's now uh, doing at uh, my alma mater, one of my alma maters, I mean, I did my uh, doctorate at this August institution at Yale where, Niels, where, where um, Jason now teaches, uh, but here he makes connections. He makes connections with Africana studies, he makes connections with the local community, he makes connections that with, the, with the unfortunate system of incarceration to create opportunities for communities here. And of course, he's part of this global battle right now, which is important for a philosopher of language to deal with, which is of course the misrepresentation of language and its use for nefarious measures. So his work on propaganda and also his work in dealing with what happened in World War II, uh, to which he has a direct connection through his parents, uh, are among the many reasons. But frankly, we're here because we're philosophers who love thinking. And thinking means uh, speaking together, enjoying each other's company. And so, my friend, Jason Stanley. Thank you, Lewis. And this is Lewis Gordon, uh, someone who I've admired for as long as I remember as a philosopher. Lewis, you, your work uh, really pioneered uh, in philosophy circles uh, the study of ideology that was done uh, by Marxists and sociology uh, and other fields but uh, your work on bad faith, uh, your work, uh, your, 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 the, the, from, from looking at ideology from the perspective of race informed by gender and class, uh, for a very long time there were few philosophers working on this. Uh, your, your work is informed uniquely, I think, by every tradition in philosophy. And when I say every tradition in philosophy, I mean every <laughs> tradition, like, uh, every continent, every... Uh, and the way you have synthesized uh, the kinds of uh, enormous background uh, that probably you uniquely possess uh, to address the topics that, as public philosophers, we need to address, namely, why do people act against the evidence? Why do we again and again see the same tropes reoccurring in the vilification of our fellow human beings? Uh, I draw on your work in my work and in my teaching, and it's an honor and a privilege to be your friend now. And a pleasure, <laughs> I should say. Well, as we say, the feeling's mutual. But first, I've got to talk to you about these two <laughs> photographs. So the two photographs, uh, yeah, I just, you know, I mean, yo, there's, <laughs> there's James looking at William Van Orman Quine. <laughs> Care to yeah. talk about it? <laughs> so. So these, uh, th these, are, these are photographs by the great photographer Steve Pike, who set out to photograph uh, philosophers. So he has a long, like, 30 to 40 year career uh, photographing philosophers. He himself is not a philosopher, so he had to go essentially by word of mouth. Uh, so this is from his first set of, of photographs. Uh, this is from, I think, 1989. So uh, is that when C.L.R. James passed, passed away? passed away in 89. Yeah, yeah, so this is from 1989, three weeks before he, he passed away. This is from 1991. Uh, this is the Quine I knew as a graduate student. And these two figures have, uh, you know, th they represent uh, the two opposing forces <laughs> that have shaped and formed me. My father gave me black Jacobins uh, for my bar mitzvah present when I was 13. Uh, Good present. Yeah, my father was uh, was an anti-colonial theorist. Uh, uh, it was in East African studies at Syracuse University, and uh, and Quine, of course, uh, formed my uh, my background as an analytic philosopher, mm -hmm. uh, and deeply affected. Both of these figures have had a great influence on you as well. Uh, politically, they're on opposing sides of the spectrum, so I think it's justice that Quine has to spend his his remainder 
uh, his his days staring at CLR James. Oh, wow, it's almost like the penultimate scene in Dante's Inferno. <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, a little bit of, yeah, the, the, the big stare, so to speak. Though, I mean, uh, there's so many things. I mean, you know, CLR James is connected to my first book in a very unusual way because my first book was Bad Faith and Anti-Black Racism. It, it, the, the classic. It, and there's a, there's a section in there where I, I talk about the property. And, you know, the, I love that closing line of Black Jacobins where C.L.R. James said, you know, um, um, he, he points out a very basic argument, right? Which is, um, which is if, 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 if slave masters really took the position that these, peop that these were exclusively property, you know, nobody brings up their property and say, you know what, I'm going to bring my, bring my property home uh -huh. and I'm going to start beating it. I'm going to start <laughs> raping it. Yeah. I'm going to smack it up, spit on it, and humiliate it. They, they shine their car. They take right. care of it. Yet the abuse, why so much abuse during the period of enslavement? And James, I think, just said it so beautifully, which is why I, I taught it when I was a high school teacher. I teach it when I teach Intro to Africana Studies. I teach it. Uh, in philosophy classes, particularly in social political philosophy, and he says it beautifully. He says that despite uh, you can humiliate them, whip them, you could put them in cages, you could torture them, you could do all this, but the truth is, you know, deep down as you do every bit of this to them, that they're human beings, and they have all the resentments and the memories and the thrivings of human beings. And it's such a beautiful passage. Yeah. Because it, it, it really <clears throat> walks into the future and counters some of this nihilistic crap that's thrown on a lot of people to, to, to believe in the notion of human ontological difference, the absolute notion that there are people outside of a communicative framework with right. other people. So that's one of the reasons why I teach it. And, and of course, there are many other reasons for, you know, there is an ironic connection between the two of them, though. <laughs> this I would like to hear. <laughs> well, James's, in, in Notes and Dialectics, James's criticism was of the idea that, that, and it's not just James, you could find this in, in the Haitian Revolution, you could find it in Frantz Fanon's writings, you can find it in a lot of what's called the black radical tradition writings, but, but he, he says it very well, is there's always a danger of dialectical thought becoming undialectical. In other words, treated as a closed determinacy. And to his credit, Klein, was particularly, although he was from a philosophical position that's trying to close all things into a kind of maximum consistency, he was aware that it would have these fissures and indeterminacy. Right. And in a way, so at the metacritical level, at the theory about the theory, both of them are in, agree in agreement that you're going to find yourself encountering situations that are open instead of closed. Well, that's really what, to me, if I think about black Jacobins, uh, that's its major message with, uh, with the conflict between uh, Toussaint and Dessalines. I mean, they represent such radically different things, the liberal naivete mm -hmm. on the one hand and the brutality that is successful in war that you need, the realist brutality. And there's no resolution in that book. Mm -hmm. You're not left with a resolution. Uh, you know, Dessalines wins. Uh, Dessalines is the, the military uh, leader. Uh, Toussaint is the is the uh, is the great you know humanitarian, uh, but the humanitarianism leads to naivete and loss, mm -hmm. and the brutality leads to just emulating those whom you defeat, and we're left with so that is the dialectic that is the unresolvable dialectic of it black Jacobins. There's a great analysis of that by a fellow called Jeremy Glick at Hunter College, where he points out. Though that and, and and this is against the more postmodernist positions, that even with all that, the fundamental thing by the Haitian, raised in the Haitian Revolution, is a, is a critical conception of sovereignty. In other words, what it is to have agency, it, and understanding that it's a flawed agency. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not perfect agency, but it's an agency that um, it, it it reminds me a little of this wonderful thing I was listening on the radio on the way in. Uh, by uh, a woman by the name of Edwards, Tracy Edwards. Mm -hmm. She led the first woman um, crew to go around the globe in a, in a, in a, in a race, right? And, um, and the thing is, she said repeatedly, uh, there are two problems you're going to have. The first one is you're going to die. <laughs> <laughs> right. So they were saying it was impossible 
The second one she was told is, oh, you're a woman, you're going to fight among yourselves and, <laughs> and you'll fail. And so she, and, and what she realized at the end, she was, is that um, there is something about creating something people say could not exist. Right. And that it raises its new, it, sure, they weren't perfect, but they not, but no one can say to women anymore, you cannot sail around the world with an all female crew. And the bottom line is it took a lot of effort to destroy, to undermine the Haitian revolution. The truth of the matter is uh, what they have demonstrated is that they could create a republic. Yeah. And that's, that's something for which so many of us are grateful. Right. And the world has tried to punish them try to for punish 200 them. plus years. <laughs>